positive feedback loop. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Positive Feedback Loop podcast. Uh, as you know, I'm your host, Ray, and with me is Luis and Stephanie. Hello! Hi, everyone. And today we have a very special episode. We're going to actually delve into the topic that we all think actually is pretty super interesting, especially me, uh, the cross between decentralized voting on the blockchain. And what's very special about this episode is we actually have a guest, Sandra Miller, and she's the operations and community head of Democracy.Earth. Sandra, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Sandra is the is a data scientist who began her career in statistical modeling and consumer packaged goods. She migrated from Connecticut to Texas, began working in high tech industry in the 1990s, and she started first in the computer hardware industry before landing in the Bay Area to become a serial software entrepreneur. Sandra has built global advertising models, CRM, which is Customer Relationship Management based healthcare customer service systems and manage some of the largest data repositories for the largest companies in the world, including Anheuser-Busch, Compaq Computer, which is HP now, and Dell Computer. She was also named by American Demographic Magazines, the People Magazine of Social Scientists. That's really interesting. As one of its stars of the 21st century. That's awesome. Really happy to have you. Uh, she was born in the Midwest, she had a bachelor's in arts and master's in arts from Eastern Illinois University and working on her PhD in mass communication effects and telecommunication policy and law at Indiana University. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> she has traveled and worked all over the world. Interests are reading, writing horror fiction, alpine skiing and ultra marathoning. Wow, you've done so much. Really happy to have you on here. Thank you for coming. Well, it's great to be here. And our first question, jumping right into it, is what is Democracy.Earth? Let's start with what we are. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, so Democracy Earth Foundation. We're the first dot .earth in the domain. So for a long time, if you just typed dot .earth in your URL, in your search engine, uh, our company came up because we were the only one, which was kind of cool. You just tell people, type dot .earth, and they're like, hey, <laughs> there you are. Uh, so we're based in California. We're also operating in New York. Um, but practically speaking, the, the sun never sets on the foundation. We're really a global diaspora. Uh, we are in about 15 people, contributors in like nine countries. So what we do, we're a software company, and we're building a decentralized governance platform that enables organizations to incorruptibly corruptibly, sorry, record votes and decisions. So uh, what Democracy Earth tries to do is set the internet as a jurisdiction, leveraging existing technologies to distribute votes as a human right. That's kind of like if I had to be in an elevator. Bigger picture, you know, our open source blockchain-based mobile uh, app is called Sovereign. And the idea there is to give individuals the power to store and transfer and even potentially monetize all forms of digitized power. So not just their vote, but their reputation, social media, purchase history, and more. So that's kind of like, you know, the long game. So we're a global group of software developers and like hacktivists, I guess you, you would say. And we all believe what like sort of the common vision that, uh, that brings the whole team together is that we believe the future of governance, whether we're talking about the most populous nations, all the way down to the smallest incorporated organization, it, the future of governance lies in software built on distributed public technology. I have a question. How did you begin? What are the origins of the organization? Who brought it together? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's a really interesting uh, evolution. So we started off in uh, Argentina with Santiago Siri and Pia Mancini, our co-founders, and they started a political party, Partito de la Red, the internet party, and with the platform of we are going to base all of our votes based on the, the voter mandate. You know, so people will vote, we will monitor it, we will, we will always reflect citizens, you know, because of this worldwide feeling that people have that government is no longer representing them, that their voices aren't heard, that their voices are frozen with representatives who, once they get the vote, you know, basically push aside and, and, and vote based on their the moneyed interests and, and not the citizen interest. They started out, they, they got, became a political party, went through that process in Argentina, and in that process, uh, and running for office, which was a pretty big deal, some, you know, they're in their 20s and had a pretty massive movement of people behind them, you know, they didn't gain a lot of votes. 
no one, ex- you know, you wouldn't expect that necessarily. But what they did gain is this this idea that things could be done differently became this movement behind them. And they also gained a perspective that the real enemy was corruption, that that was actually what they were fighting, what they're fighting to change, right? That that was the the, the uh, barrier in the road um, to improving democracy. So Santi is a, a coder. He's a game developer. Pia is a political theorist and political activist. So they took this experience they had with Partito della Red and they turned it into um, Democracy OS. And this is an organization that helps groups come together because the institutional layer is where the change will take place, right? Where decisions can start having an impact. There's still Democracy OS organizations operating now. In 2015, Y Combinator gave them a call and said, hey, come on down here. Uh, to California, we're pretty interested in you guys. Like we think that governance on the blockchain is something no one's talking about right now, except you guys. And it sounds pretty interesting. That's when they came together. So they came to Silicon Valley and uh, they they, uh, were accelerated by both Y Combinator and Fast Forward. And that's when they joined forces with Herb Stevens and made a uh, transition from Democracy OS to Democracy Foundation. Herb is a serial entrepreneur, formerly of GE. He's been a sort of disintermediation specialist his whole life. In 2010, he actually told his partner, there's an interesting story where he came in, told his software partner at the time, I found the thing I'm going to work on for the rest of my life. It's blockchain. And everybody's like, block what? Like (laughs) back then. So it was very (laughs) auspicious, like when he like convened, you know, with Santi and Pia, like it was sort of like a, a, a really auspicious, like coming together of minds. Ever since then, we've been uh, writing code and getting our product out. We're pretty visible online as Democracy Earth Foundation since 2015. That's when the foundation became a legal entity. And so now we have, like I said, a diaspora. We've attracted uh, developers and thinkers and political theorists and, and people from all over the world. We have a really big community that came with Santi and Pia. So Santi's got like, he's one of those people with like 60,000 uh, Twitter followers. Pia is like pretty similar. Um, so we have a had a big following like already. Our Slack community is like, you know, over 1600. We have almost a thousand stars on GitHub. So while you haven't been hearing about governance on the blockchain, maybe for more than a year, um, you know, we, our organization looks a little more mature because of, of those those beginnings. So I have a question that kind of follows up mm-hmm. on the name of Democracy Earth, which is the word democracy. I, as I was reading through um, the white paper, I, I was really interested in this idea of everybody has their votes, but they can also delegate votes to some mm-hmm. a trusted party. So I guess it, a twofold question is, first, does this, does this then have some resemblance to a republic more than a democracy at that point where, where votes are delegated and you start to maybe... A, representatives maybe emerge in this sort of a system or is or is something else and also how would you avoid an analog or offline corruption where votes are sold and uh, bartered in some way just just to clarify for listeners before giving Sandra a chance to respond, uh, in the white paper for uh, democracy.earth they talk about some of the possibilities for voting and they talk about you could use your vote directly but you get a, p- a set number of votes which you can delegate, give to someone else that you think it has a voice you can trust, and you can give them that directly, or you can give it with uh, conditions, like you can only use this if you want to vote on, a, on something related to the environment. So uh, you're giving that vote in that, for that specific sort of uh, issue. And I should also say just thanks for coming on the podcast, <laughs> Sandra. <laughs> I'm so interested <laughs> in your answer because it's really fun to hear uh, from the people of who've initially founded this and thought it up. And so, yeah. Thanks. Ditto. <laughs> well, thanks again for having me. It's a, you know, it's a, sometimes it can be a conversation killer when people say like, what do you do? It's like, oh, we're building political cryptocurrency for a post-nation state world. And it's just like all conversation stops for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, there's something now, we do nowadays, is talk. Yeah, nowadays people are pretty interested. The world has changed a lot in the last six to 12 months. And people, there are certain words in the lexicon now that just weren't there, like, you know, cryptocurrency. So, you know, so let's talk about liquid democracies. Liquid democracy kind of removes the territorial basis for identity and voice, if you will. So let's, I want to put the word liquid in a, the context of what it means. So right now, if you think about how democracy works right now, when you elect a representative, your vote stays frozen with that representative 
for whatever X period of time until the next election. So it could be two, four, or six years. It just stays frozen, right? And then it's kind of all based on trust. You know, trust me to be your representative and I will represent you on this platform that I I ran on. And then, you know, your trust remains frozen with me. And if I violate your trust, I'm not accountable to your trust. There's really not much you can do because it's frozen with me. So liquid democracy proposes to, to melt that uh, frozen trust. Uh, and yes, what, what liquid democracy does is it'll, it's a combination of representative democracy and direct democracy. So a lot of people think, oh, no, it's never going to work because you're not going to be able to like, substitute representative democracy that we all know with this new thing. No, no, no. Liquid democracy supports representative democracy. It just kind of improves it or, or takes it to a, a, the next layer, the next level based on technology um, that we didn't have before and we do now. So the way our democracies are organized and we outsource that decision making to this very small group of representatives and... And what liquid democracy does is it enables liquid representation where you can delegate your vote to anyone in your social graph. So not just in your nation state border defined territory, which is what we have to do now, but anyone in your social graph. And we're the in infrastructure democracy earth is to kind of create that global institution where everybody can have a voice. Having a voice should not be dependent on where you live or be mediated by a jurisdiction. And, and in a way it seems a little crazy to think that it does, right? I mean, right now, all digital natives operate with the internet as their jurisdiction for all intents and purposes. They're not bound by, you know, they don't think about the territory of their nation state at all because they're online, like crossing borders seamlessly all the time in their conversations and their, and their interactions. So there's no reason now that voting should not follow that path. Uh, and and, and we now, with blockchain, have the infrastructure and smartphones um, to create global institutions where everyone has a voice. So uh, regardless of, you know, the nation state boundary. So the rise of that peer to peer network, you know, it really eliminates the need for political intermediation where you have to, you know, send a representative because we're in a horse and, you know, they're going on a horse and carriage all the way across the country <laughs> to Washington. You know, these are these these methods that we have right now um, that drive our democracy, um, that our democratic institutions are based on very old technologies and old institutions that just have not caught up. Right. So. Peer-to-peer -peer eliminates that need for political intermediation. Now can give way to direct democracy enabled by blockchains. I would just like to say that I would pay money to see all of our representatives take a, a coach and buggy ride all the way to Washington, D.C. every single year. I think it's <laughs> hilarious. Uh, we could live stream it and make money off of it. I do have a question, though. In, you, you mentioned you know this is an idea that helps fight corruption. I think the idea of empowering voters with uh, something that allows them to have more trust in the legitimacy of whatever choices they've made is fantastic. But you mentioned it, this is a tool for fighting corruption and blockchain does allow us to have a lot more accountability in what we do. But it doesn't eliminate human nature completely, at least not, at least I don't foresee that being the case in the near future. Institutions themselves seem to be still accounted for within the purview of democracy.earth, the way it's structured, at least based on the white paper, is it's as an aid to institutions to allow their decision making, right? Allow them to empower their users, their customers, whatever it is, to make those decisions. But ultimately, there is still some central authority that has to say, hey, this is this is what our goals are. This is uh, what we expect. This is how the settings, these are the, the things that we're going to be voting on. So how does this kind of mesh with your idea of... Uh, borderless kind of nation states, uh, especially in lieu of things, for example, let's say you wanted to have someone, uh, let's say I wanted to receive as many votes as I could. So I start offering people money in exchange for their votes. Mm -hmm. uh, without a central authority, how would that be stopped, for example? Well, yeah, but, you know, no technology is some magic panacea that stops people from being people or stops corruption on its own. Every, every technology can be... Uh, corrupted. Uh, and I like to hear when people say, oh, Bitcoin, you know, it's the, it's the harbor of thieves. And it's like, yeah, the Treasury estimates that something like 50% of currency is offshore or in the, <laughs> in the gray market, right? Because there's nothing as corruptible or enables corruption better than the $100 bill, like nothing. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, technology doesn't like protect us from that. And we're not claiming to have all of this figured out yet, but what we think the key for voters is liquidity. If you had a finite number of votes that you could get, 
And then that was all the votes you had. What you're talking about, you know, becomes something of an issue. Uh, and yeah, you're right. Institutions still have to like, uh, if there's going to be a national vote for president, let's say in a month, we would still be under that jurisdiction. So we're not, that's all the same, but now we have a different way to vote. Imagine if right after the vote, imagine if you had an always on presidential vote for a second, like always on. So in other words, oh, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I cast my vote. And then shortly after the election, like the candidate is not keeping their promises, you know, they're, they're, they're violating my trust, I can signal, oh, I'm going to vote the next time around, let's say like elections or every year or something by just le- like moving my vote. It's always on, I've moved it. So it's like, yeah, sure, the election's over. But we don't need polling anymore when you can verify votes on the blockchain, right? So I can signal what's going on, right? Like with me, without ever needing a poll, without ever needing to, to, to go out and like recount. I was just thinking today about uh, a recount that happened in Virginia this year. So two candidates, I think it was 10, 10 votes they were different by. And um, so they ordered a recount and then there was like one vote they were different by. So guess how they made the decision? They put lots in a, a lovely ceramic bowl. That's how they described it. And then someone drew a lot out of that with a name. And that was how the representative was chosen. So democracy wow. was completely subverted, right? <laughs> really, it was just completely subverted because it was too cost inefficient to go through the whole process again of having people have their vote and have their say. That's not an issue, actually, with the blockchain because everyone can verify the votes. It puts that transparency in everybody's hands. It's not some special commission that has to count the votes. Like, we all have that power. So it's an extremely important power, um, especially when you think about it's an accounting system, right? The blockchain is an accounting system. It's a ledger. It's an incorruptible public ledger. And storing decisions on a tool like that is really powerful when you think about countries where the vote is not held sacred, right? Where countries like Argentina, where they're still burning, up, literally physically burning up ballot boxes, you know, and it's not not just to pick on Argentina, but, uh, you know, our co-founders witnessed those things. Well, and there's even, right? so, there are even problems validating votes. I mean, I used to live in Cambridge, Massachusetts until recently. And you show up to the voting place and you say your name and your address and they say, okay, great, here's your ballot. They don't, they didn't ask me for an ID. (laughs) My neighbor could have just gone and pretended they were me. It's really terrifying. The blockchain also is a way to to verify records. It allows me a chance to to have an immutable identity that somebody can't can't challenge. So if you if you read our white paper, I'm not sure if you got to the point where Santi registered his daughter on the blockchain, her birth certificate, right? So and declared her. You know, it, he cooked that up with uh, somebody from Blockstack. We actually think that at some point. It's going to look a lot like that, the way we vo- the way we validate our ID and prove that we're not a replicant or a sibyl. And the way democracy Earth works is when you have when you have logged on to Sovereign, uh, we're, I'm putting us in the future now because right now we're just an alpha. <laughs> but when you've logged on to Sovereign and proven your identity through some combination of attention mining and computation, then you start getting your votes dripped to you, okay, over over a period of time. So um, you can never really sell all your votes because these votes are dripped to you, sort of in a like a universal basic income, okay, as you're right over time. The, the votes kind of keep pace with you as time unravels, right? Uh, time is like, what, so what we're doing is we're pegging it to time because time is the most like immutable force that everything boils down to, right? That's, that's, that's where action, that's where everything's monetized. That's the most uh, critical definition of energy. Uh, spent, if you will. Well, and could somebody then hoard, if the older you are, could you hoard votes? Well, you could, but I mean, what good would it do you? Let, let's think about it. Nothing's going to change the fact that I get one vote in the presidential election. So while someone might delegate a lot of votes to me, and I've earned a lot of people's trust, it's not going to enable me to vote a thousand times for the president. I mean, go- governance of elections will still exist. Okay. But to get at your other question, then, um, so, okay, how, how do you how do we have an internet as a jurisdiction and, and nation states not have the monopoly on power? So I guess what I do, I'd start off by saying like in a word, when a system's not working, you can't, it's sort of futile to change it, try to change it from within because power is mostly interested in perpetuating itself. So it's sort of against the status quo to change it. I mean, that's just nature, you know, that's how things are. So you build something as Buckminster Fuller says, you build a new system that replaces it that people just re- prefer to use instead. And, and, and that's kind of the thinking here, right? So blockchain, why would we need blockchain in government? Why would people prefer that? Why would they move towards it or buy into it? 
it's because of accountability. So politics is soft promises, then blockchains are about hard promises, and they're combined with permissionless transparency. So it offers us a chance to eliminate uncertainty and blind trust in governance, okay? Uh, you know, a more transcendent way or intelligent way to address critical issues like climate change and terrorism and migration, which are not being addressed right now at all within the boundaries of nation states. And I can bring it down to a smaller, more microcosm view, like in the U.S., the majority of Americans want some form of gun control, some form. They want to see some change, right? Uh, and we're not seeing it, right? So it's a, uh, it's kind of a similar thing. The point that you both are discussing in terms of, you know, what happens with a really powerful single issue voter, right? Let's say that, like, I don't care about healthcare or the environment or anything else. I just care about gun control. And any infringement on my Second Amendment rights is the end for me. So I hoard all my votes so I can use them on this, or I accumulate votes from others so I can use them just for this one topic. And I think one of the options that um, the white paper brings up, which kind of addresses this, I'm sure you guys are working on figuring something out, is quadratic voting, which means mm -hmm. that for every additional vote you invest into an issue, it becomes more expensive the next to get an additional vote in. So the first one, it may only take you one vote token to vote your initial response. You, you say no to gun control. And then the next one, you want to also vote no to gun control. It's going to be four votes. Yeah, and then because so on progressively and so more expensive to put your yeah. money where your mouth is. So if you really, that isn't your intention. Exactly. If it's not, if your intention is really just to hoard votes and, and try to overwhelm the system, it would be a very costly thing to do. And you would have to choose not to vote on things that are important to you. I, you can experience that right now with Sovereign. So you'll get a thousand votes when you log in. And then you can start voting on issues that are there. Uh, and we're actually um, eating our own dog food, so to speak. So we're voting on, like, we have a design community that's helping us design, <laughs> helping us design the interface for onboarding. And we're voting on those interface options um, in the application. So you that's, can say, I love this, and give it 100 votes out of your 1,000. That's really interesting, actually. Uh, I was just thinking about how you, as the person running the community and trying to build that those peer-to-peer -peer networks and connecting these people together, that's quite an effort, especially in the beginning. And I think that's kind of what we should uh, kind of spend some time in the second half, kind of talking about how you're building that community. So we're going to break now, positive feedback loop break. And um, again, Sandra Miller, stay tuned. This is going to be really interesting. I think the first part was amazing, very, very uh, insightful. So thank you. Uh, and stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back. Thanks. We are 21st century citizens interacting with institutions designed in the 19th century using technology from the 15th century. If you think democracy is ready for a reboot on the blockchain, you might want to consider joining the Democracy Earth team as an ambassador. The Democracy Earth Ambassadors Program was created so that our community members around the world can kickstart the conversation about what kind of democracy we want in the internet age. We're reaching out to democracy's decision makers. Those organizations, collectives, and institutions that can significantly benefit by implementing liquid democracy practices in their own governance. That's where our ambassadors come in. To put the tools of liquid democracy in the hands of every self-sovereign global citizen of the world, communicating the values of decision-making systems that are open source, transparent, accountable, and decentralized. The link to our Democracy Earth Ambassador Program is in the program notes, along with information about the upcoming token sale. We look forward to connecting with you. Welcome back, everybody, to the Positive Feedback Loop podcast. Hope you enjoy that commercial. And we're here talking with Sandra Miller from Democracy Earth Foundation. Sandra is going out and trying to build these networks and communities to start using Sovereign. And I'd like to ask you, Sandra, how? what are some of the challenges that you're facing as you're trying to grow the network, trying to build the Democracy Earth community and getting people to use the application? So it's kind of like, uh, how do we, we have a lot of people coming to us all the time. Democ democracy is in decline. Let's put a little contextualization around your question. Uh, sure. Democracy is in decline around the world. Less than 5% of the world's population is living in a full democracy right now. Did you know that? Partly it's because China is so big and so much of the world is in mm. that. But there's a report that just came out by the World Economic Forum. And democracy is, you know, we, we were downgraded the United States to a flawed democracy uh, so also was France, so also was Korea. 
well, that can make you depressed. Uh, what's really inspiring is we're seeing a lot of people just come out of the woodwork, you know, to say, hey, democracy is broken. There's more you know, th rise of authoritarianism. We see 30 percent of the world's population now living under an authoritarian rule. And it's created an appetite for democracy to break free from the restrictions that it's under right now. The movement's growing very quickly. Our own community ranks are about 100,000. We're seeing nascent liquid democracy endeavors all over the world, and we, we try to support those in every way we can at every jurisdictional level. So right now there's a Republican in San Diego running on kind of a liquid democracy platform. There's a mayoral candidate in San Francisco running on a liquid democracy platform. Uh, there's an, uh, we have a Democracy Earth ambassador in the UK who's trying to uh, upend the Birmingham Council with a liquid democracy platform. His name is Sonny Sang. Uh, we have a we have a ambassador in Sri Lanka that's also you know trying to bring liquid democracy platform there. Um, the number the types of people who contact us like we've had someone from Obama administration's Pentagon say we think you're doing important work we'd like to help yeah it's kind of crazy when you get some of wow. these emails coming <laughs> he goes just Google me and you're like whoa <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that's so the that's, a, that's a a pretty baller move to just tell someone look me up yeah that that was like. <laughs> Pretty confident. So, so the thing is, what we see is innovation can happen a little easier. It's less expensive on the fringes. So it's easier to start t testing ideas like liquid democracy, uh, to, to grow them like flowers in like sandboxes around the edges. And that's what we're seeing now, right? Um, but, you know, some of these flower boxes like Birmingham is the biggest council in the world. And, you know, San Francisco, these are major jurisdictions in, in a lot of ways in terms of them being known. These kind of pilots are we're flourishing with these right now. We're trying to sort of prepare the ground you know, for the change that's coming. So if we want to push the boundaries for what's doable, we have to start moving the perception of what's doable. And that's kind of our challenge now as we, you know, move out of alpha and start running these pilots. So I have a question because you, you're talking a lot about preparing for uh, allowing this system to uh, kind of create a level of equality across voters across the world. But one thing that people are definitely not equal on is access to the internet. For example, like just a quick look up, you can find that, uh, about a third of rural Amer rural Americans do not have access to broadband at home. Is that true? I didn't yeah, know that. I just, I a just third of Americans. Up, I'll, I'll post. It's a Pew Research poll, but I can post the. We can, we'll put it in the notes so that listeners can look it up afterwards. But that's that's a lot of people to not have access to the internet and thus not have access to their ability to express their rights and their and vote. So if an issue comes up, they may not have a voice. You know, it's, would... it's a good question, but I'll tell you this, the, te the technology in this case is going to be the, the least worrisome thing. So first of all, you don't need your own cell phone to vote on Sovereign. You could actually use somebody else's device. Um, shared devices wouldn't be any kind of problem. But but Internet connectivity is growing at a hockey stick growth rate. Um, we already see far more of the world connected now than we even thought four years ago. Uh, and we are definitely seeing... Um, you know, strong movement there, and it's going to continue. You know, Elon Musk is launching satellites to basically give that accessibility to the underserved in the world. So uh, I think technology is racing ahead so fast in that regard that that's not going to be the issue, actually, like the, the what I call the lightning rod issue that most people aren't connected. Most people will be, and they're already looking at the internet as the jurisdiction. Most, you know, we already do see the internet as the, us here in this virtual room, we see the internet as the jurisdiction of our lives. And this podcast is a perfect microcosm of that. As a, <laughs> you know. as a kind of side question to that, more other than just having access to the internet, there's also the issue of internet literacy. Not everyone is literate when it comes to understanding what's happening with, not everyone's literate with computers, not everyone knows what they're doing around it, not everyone knows about the latest apps or uh, all these other options. They may not have the ability to um, project their voice the right way in terms of a system as novel as this one, which could lay the possibility for people to, who have been there from the beginning to have accrue power and have more, and kind of set the groundwork for themselves to be in a hierarchy. I guess, so, but if they're listening, if they are able to get to this podcast or reach us, at least they have some <laughs> level of literacy because, you know, you know, getting to a podcast is not the easiest thing. I, I assume that this sovereign application is built in a way that's as user-friendly as possible. But, you know, what would you say to Luis's question? Well, Luis, 
Breaking out of a world where the nation states the decider, the restrictor, it's going to be a matter of survival, actually. You know, uh, not to sound like uh, like I'm a doomsayer, because I'm not actually, I'm, I'm quite optimistic, but the structures that are going to emerge, they're not going to be tied to the territory, okay, built, which is a territory is built from muscle to win, right? The new political institutions and whatever financial mechanisms, they're going to use the internet as jurisdiction to enable global action on global issues like migration, like climate change. You know, like these, these, these are a matter of human survival. And, and we've, the current system is not adequately addressing that. And there's a pretty fundamental wave worldwide of people who in their own self-interest of survival would support a new system like this, you know? So people learn the technologies, they learn as it provides them what they want and what they want to do. So nobody could have imagined, I remember when Facebook first came across my line of sight, I, um, I was totally uninterested in it because it didn't solve a problem for me. Um, but here's how it did solve a problem for me. I was online in a group and uh, that group was dismantled. It was a centralized uh, organization and the person who owned the organization basically pulled the plug one day. <laughs> and so we all had to go somewhere else. And we went to Facebook. And at that time, Facebook was still mostly known as the app that was used to rate girls' faces in college and, and then sort of escaped its boundaries and became a, a way to connect and share photos with your family and friends. And so my group, you know, we were writers. We got together and we continued to connect over Facebook. No one could have anticipated that Facebook would be the biggest nation state on earth then. But it is because people because of the rapid deployment of technology and social media. I'm thinking about Facebook and thinking about ways I create an account on Facebook. I simply can go and put an email in and I have an account, put some pictures in. All of a sudden, I have an identity, right? And now I'm thinking... No, how- Facebook has an identity. You actually don't, but go ahead. The, uh, yeah, I guess. Well, and you can create... Yeah. And people create multiple <laughs> identities can, on Facebook. Multiple- there are a lot of problems with it. Right. So, like, that's that's the problem, right? You have multiple identities. Now, how is democracy earth or sovereign how is how are you guys able to avert that kind of situation and making sure people have only one identity and there's no kind of corruption in that way well that's that's definitely the crux of digital or digitized voting uh Mm -hmm. and um you know that's not something we claim to have solved yet there's a lot of i would say the best minds in open source right now are working on it and um, those people who are working on it we're connected to i think you know the open source community is pretty intimate, uh, especially, you know, in blockchain. Um, the, so it's going to be some combination. It won't be all computation. Uh, we can kind of see in the world we're living in right now how that didn't work. Like, did you did you guys notice your Twitter accounts going down at all? Ours didn't because we don't have a million Russian bots following us. But I guess there's <laughs> quite, quite a few people yesterday were like, hey, what happened to all my followers? I lost a thousand followers. And that's because Twitter went through and cleaned out like accounts that couldn't be verified, you know, or weren't using two-factor authentication. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but basically bot accounts yeah. were. And what I love and- about that is the only people it really hurts are the people who are buying fake followers. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I love it when I that know. happens. It's the purge. <laughs> so the it'll purge. Be, it will be some combination of, you know, computation and attention mining, you know, a human can identify another human, right? So, uh, and that was what Santi was experimenting with as he created this, uh, this global, this uh, as he made a blockchain-based birth certificate for his daughter as like the first citizen of the world, right? Where it wasn't nation-state bound, um, but it, you know that uh, it was attention mined, right? You, you look at that. If you looked at how he did it, he showed he was hashing to the blockchain, and there were like individuals that could be identified in that video and corroborated by others. So. It will be some combination of those things. I don't know what it'll look like, but um, you know, there's a lot of really smart people thinking about it right now. And once people can identify themselves as their unique self, you know, uh, not a civil, but a unique person uh, on the internet, then you know, the ability to be self-sovereign in their power, um, you know, is now possible. So, you know, it's a as you said, you have an identity. Well, you don't. Facebook has your identity. It's sure. pretty interesting when you think about trying to prove yourself without using a third-party institution, isn't it? I'm curious. I, I, I want to go back to something you said earlier because it's still banging around in my head. But you referred to na- Facebook as a nation state, a statement that kind of goes a little counter to my understanding of a nation state. So I would like, if, if you could, could you uh, well, expand actually, a little bit on Well, actually, it's more like that. an authoritarian regime because yeah, let's, well, let's be honest. Mark, yeah. Mark Zuckerberg could, could Nation become, states can be authoritarian. 
he could right now decide to wipe our accounts off and then mimic us. And there's just not a darn thing you could do about it. You got to kind of hope and trust that somebody there will recognize that that's not a good thing to do and fix it. <laughs> but, you know, if, uh, you see examples all the time. I think it was Andreas Antonopoulos was just complaining on Twitter that he couldn't he's, access his Facebook page. Were you he's a great, that? great Bitcoin uh, evangelist and speaker and very experienced. And he's been, uh, I, I've heard him talk like, three or four years ago at MIT and when people, when, you know, people were still not sure about Bitcoin still. Um, yeah. And also Santiago Siri has a TED talk that I listened to a video. It's a great piece. I think that, you know, our audience should definitely check it out. Santiago Siri's TED talk. Just wanted to throw we'll that out. The there. Yeah, we will. So I have uh, a question have that's a little more meta if I, if I can. Um, I, I wonder about, so the voting process, although, we could see it as above party lines, uh, above what uh, may be seen as as parties. Yeah. It's still no is, red, no blue, right, purple, right. That's what we said. <laughs> um, but it's it's still politicized, where you where you know certain parties do still see what they think the voting process should be. For example, you know, should we have a pure democracy, or is there value in the electoral college, or you know, other forms of of voting? And so I wonder. Is Democracy Earth really representative of certain party ideals or, or are you challenged by certain parties? Or We're not a political organization, so we're not blue. We're not red. We, we say we're purple and, uh, and we are. Uh, we're only political in the sense that our aim is to use politics to make people aware of the power that they already have in their hands and migrate towards peer-to-peer -to -peer networks rather than continuing to legitimize the current system of, of uh, non-liquid democracy that will go back to ignoring them once an election is over. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of our, our that, that's how we would be political, I guess, is what you'd say. So party neutral, you know, just like we're blockchain agnostic, but, but you know, the use of politics to um, make people aware of their own power and, and how to claim it. Now, to the degree that there are party differences in um, the desire to go against democratic values, like uh, suppress votes or something like that. You know, I suppose there might be some conflicts, but it's not something that people ideologically want to admit to. Well, I think about, and, for and, example, and about people who don't, I mean, politically don't believe in an, in a pure democracy, but in but do uh, desire an electoral college only because it helps minority geographies have a voice well remember the electoral college so, exists because direct democracy doesn't right so the electoral right. college is like a, well a the u.s of, is founded on, as a republic and so yeah uh so so that's what i'm curious about is is do you get challenges from those who who want a who believe in uh kind of a uh, believe more in a, a republic than a pure democracy because of the voice it gives to minority groups. And I, just I do to, hear that. And, and if I might, yeah, <laughs> and if I might just add a side question to that, because that's an interesting topic. How do you resolve? How do you resolve issues between groups? Let's say I am part of two groups at the same time, which are in conflict. What stops me from doing something which incentivizes me to vote against the interest of the group A? Or how does the group resolve this conflict between groups, essentially, when mm -hmm. it's it's all about consensus rather than about there is no coercion mechanism or no mechanism to ensure action? Mm -hmm. Well, there is going to be a collaborative or agora aspect to um, Democracy Earth. And, and we have some side projects going on right now with some of our community members who like brought us these ideas in different stages of development and said, oh, we, we think we can sort of bolt this on to what you're doing. We're like, yeah, let's not reinvent the wheel. A rising tide will lift all boats. Let's work together on that. So there will be like an agora for uh, discussion. And, you know, the, the dirty work of democracy is deliberation. It's, it is discussion. And to get to your point, Stephanie, so yeah, I guess what I would say is we have a system like that now. And the fact that there are so many uh, efforts underway, all moving in the same direction to create a, par a system in parallel that does give everybody <laughs> their direct voice tells that gives me the answer right there. It's like there are more there are more people interested in exercising their right to control their destiny than there are people interested in preventing them. And so uh, that's why we're, you know, and now we finally have technology that can um 
you know, maybe overwhelm the the old methods of doing things that have had sort of a monopoly. And, and you're seeing it everywhere, right? Uh, I, I've been reading a lot about the rise of the dark intellectual web. The fall of mass media is giving rise to like, right, uh, cohorts of influence that never existed before, right? And it's because of the internet as a jurisdiction. So things are like changing in very dramatic ways in, in many institutions, right? And, and so it'll be in media, it'll be in governance. You know, we've already seen the culture change a lot with the but internet, in, right? But actually, going off of that example, couldn't we also say that that's also a double-edged sword? Because with the fall of trusted institutions, which, for example, the media, which could say, hey, this this is the, the information that you're going to be receiving. Uh, we've vetted this information and we say it's it's good. Um, now you have all these actors who are giving information with no verification mechanism because mm -hmm. they can say whatever and... There's so many of them. Eventually, in a block, yeah. something well, that's one will of the make things. its way. Isn't that happening now, though? Isn't that what's going on that, at that's the moment? Literally what I'm, yeah, that's, that's exactly what yeah. I'm referring to, the stuff so. that's going on now. Well, so what the blockchain brings us as a society um, is accountability, right? It, show, it brings us um, the ability to get back to provenance of something. It's an accounting system. It's a ledger for everything. So if I want to know the provenance of a story or if I want to know the provenance of my meat, you know, the blockchain is going to be really good for these things. Now, it doesn't mean it stops humans from being dishonest, right? So the blockchain is only as honest as the weakest link, you know, like contributing to it. I mean, human beings are still human beings. There's no doubt about that. But like when I think about things like... Um, you know, storing decisions on a tool like that, like we said before, it's, it's just very powerful. I was just thinking today, remember when Jill Stein said, let's get a recount um, going. It's going to cost a million dollars. And she kind of posted all that. And then I saw, I, I, I know a lot of people gave money to that. And I remember seeing the mount climb over a million. Anybody know where that went? I believe they started, uh, like they, they did, there were some legal fees that they needed to pay. Yep. There was like $6 million they needed total for the recount. And they made it through like the first few hurdles, but it didn't go yeah. all the way. And then they just gave up, so I think. What the blockchain lets you do is go beyond trust to a, like a smart contract can then say, okay, if we reach this milestone or this decision, then funds are released and everybody can see that they were. Oh, and I so just remembered. Sorry, just to correct myself. I do believe they put it into a pack. They used mm -hmm. the money to go into a pack for mm -hmm. political reasons. That's, I think, what it was. Sorry. Go ahead. So, so in a blockchain world, you know, we could have a, like, we can even look at a more, uh, more current example. Let's look at Venezuela, who has just held it's the first mm -hmm. initial country offering, as we've been. The Petro, right? Yeah, Petro coin. Petro. Mm -hmm. The Petro crypto. Uh, and um, so. They're going. Uh, so uh, you guys have posed a question to me earlier, uh, like a list of sample questions. And one was, "What coins can you trust? How do you know?" That was like one of your questions. And I immediately yeah. thought of the Petro. And I'm, I'm going to put that out there, like bring that, pull that question into this conversation now, um, because it is how, how do you? It is about trust, right? How do I? Do I trust the project? Do I trust the team? Do I trust that this? Uh, you know, do I trust the actors? Do I trust their motivations? In this case, even though this is a cryptocurrency and a blockchain, like what, what would you give the trust rating on this on a scale of one to 10? Well, the, the US Treasury gives it a zero, okay? Because <laughs> they're like, it's a transparent attempt for these guys to get credit based on their oil from, uh, you know, to avoid, uh, well, and evade US sanctions, you know, and get money from like Russia and China and Iran, I think, uh, or countries they named as, as uh, purchasers interested in their presale. Uh, what's your trust that that money is going to flow back to starving Venezuelans? I mean, kind of take a poll here, high or low. I haven't done enough research into it, so I wouldn't be able to say. It, but I'm probably at like maybe five, somewhere in, in the middle. Yeah. Basis. I mean, you guys know the state of Venezuela right now. Based Six on people in the based diaspora. On just, based on just a general dysfunction of yeah. their current uh, economic state, I will say I. I I don't. I have not read a lot about Petrocoin, but I will say, just going in this blind, I would probably give it a very low rating. So you know, Venezuelans are starving now. I mean, they're they're having children are dying of starvation, and every day thousands of people cross the border to Colombia just to try to get some food and get some work, um, and uh, and many will maybe never return. There are just heartbreaking stories of people giving up their children for adoption because they can no longer or just leaving them, you know, at places and think, I uh, hopefully I can come back in a year. You know, I, I'm going to go across the border, try to make some money. I mean, these, these are, are real people. lives. These are real people's real lives. People. And it's not like, you know, an imagination that we might feel 
because Not of the way dystopian. media per is portrayed it's to now. us. It's now it's, it's happening. happening. And this is an example where blockchain is not, you know, it's like we said, it's not a panacea, right? So here we have a cryptocurrency in the hands of a nation state, an authoritarian state. And we don't have any of, you know, we don't have any of the conditions, though, that uh, make us, what, what makes blockchain and Bitcoin so exciting, right? Uh, because it, it can be trustless. It can be, uh, there's accountability, there's transparency, there's none of that. It was an ERC-20 token right up until the night it was issued, and then they, like, changed it. And then they went back and, like, changed the white paper real quick, too. Well, <laughs> so it's, it's pre-mined, so it's not even – you can't create new coins after they issue it. I mean, there are a lot of aspects of the Petro coin that are different than Bitcoin, for example. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's backed by oil, but then not really. If you read the white paper, they're really saying it's backed by bolivars, uh, the, the amount of oil yeah. in bolivars. So, mm -hmm. you know, so now we're back into the same – petrodollar in the fiat like yeah. problem where you see cab drivers that used to be surgeons in Venezuela with literally stacks of money in their hands because you know there's like 35,000 percent inflation right yeah. <laughs> it's like so um so yeah it's, blockchain's not a panacea uh, the trust is only going to be as far as the actors creating the platform like working on the platform and creating the apps on the platform um so it, it all seems to be a level of a balance right um, the more you decentralize the process, the more options you have for uh, increasing uh, transparency, and it can it can bring a lot of benefits. But at the same time, you also increase the the level of it. Also, is highly speculative. That's right. the other issue, right? Uh, a lot of coins nowadays are extremely speculative. Have you seen the boom and bust of Bitcoin of the last couple of weeks? It's been insane. And similarly, there is also increasing centralization just from the fact that mining is much more efficient if you are a dedicated miner. So you can produce a lot more. You, it's, it's more worth your time and effort. And so there is increasing level of um, monopolization of nodes. That being said, that's not to say that the whole we should throw out the, entire, the baby with the bathwater. There are still great things about blockchain and it's projects like this that are interesting to explore and see some possible uses for it. I mean, we see right. things like legit coin. I just have to bring that one up because I love the name of it. Legit coin. What, what do you guys think? Am I going to describe a coin that's legit sounds, or not? What do sounds you think? legit to me. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where are you throwing money? I just wrote Make it down. It says, it's a revolution. I use the word revolution. That will help you get rich quick. Best of all, there's no risk or hard work involved whatsoever. Oh, dear. That was like, that was a Google AdWords like ad. like And so... Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. So the, the truth, when you say, what, what's the truth? What coins can you trust? The truth is the trust. A, a coin is as trusted as the project ID and the team behind it. You know, so, And you can't trust your own sense of trust, uh, meaning you have to understand the world as it is now. You have to understand what Venezuela has been going through in the last five years to understand what the Petro means now. You, you can't understand one without the other. You know, um, So the U.S. Treasury did, is, you know, they issued a caveat emptor, you know, they said, or suffer the consequences. So they told Americans, you know, if you vote for that, you're basically voting to take money out of the mouths of starving Venezuelans and give it to the corrupt regime. And we will come after you. Like you will suffer. They did not name the consequences, but they said, you'll suffer them. So they're watching. So the project, the team, their accomplishments, their, and that's partly their white paper, their code, their roadmap, you know, doesn't need to be a blockchain. Um, and that's why we're in kind of a, a this situation, it's it's hard, harder than it sounds to identify what you can trust, right? Because some people, oh, I haven't done the research. I don't know about Petro. But if you know the last two years history of Venezuela, you kind of know what you need to know, you know, but. Right. And also, I think that this this like time in our uh, in this technology, this like evolution that we're seeing, uh, it's going by so quickly. It is kind of like the Wild West. So you have lots of different people and organizations actually doing experiments like at each one of these ICOs, each one of these utility tokens and uh, cryptocurrencies it's all experiments so you have different types of uh, you know ways that they're forming their own little economy so you have some nodes maybe some master nodes the way that they're divvying up the different stakes within uh, that entire supply of cryptocurrencies how long it's taking for uh, the cryptocurrency to be fully mined like for example and with bitcoin uh it it'll reach 21 million by 2040 so that's that's one experiment right so um and it's really fascinating studying and observing and like learning about these different experiments and i think democracy earth uh foundation it's, it seems to be like one of the more um you know interesting and you know there's a lot of potential and i just feel really excited about 
continuing to learn these kinds of um yeah, the world is that we're going through yeah. a real seismic shift right now. We're at the beginning of it, you know, but I remember I saw a, a video with David Bowie talking to an interviewer and David Bowie was like back in 1999, maybe 2000. And he said, the Internet is just going to change what it means to be a creative human. It's going to redefine art. And he's he says, you know, right now, you know, you I create art and then. It goes out to a marketplace. I often don't see what happens. Uh, he's like, but with the Internet. Art won't be finished until the audience actually has interacted with it. What, you know, mm. what a concept. And the guy interviewing was just going like, <laughs> but it's just another distribution channel, isn't it? And I thought, and, and at the time, lots of people thought that. If you remember the first time you saw a newspaper on the Internet, it was just an electronic copy of the physical copy. Right. Sure. In other words, we, we use new technologies just like we use the old technologies for quite a while. And people kind of don't see the incredible possibility they just see like oh things are like maybe more efficient or you know but they're not the 10x or the 100x yet but that came right like thinking that the internet is now just another distribution system is kind of kind of laughable on its face when we think of the word digital native didn't even exist back then and now we think that that's an actual dividing line between you know people who know how to innovate for the future and people who are hopelessly stuck in as dinosaurs you know in the tar pits of the institutions of the past Wow, that was poetic. <laughs> Absolutely. And with that, I think we'd like to give you like one last opportunity to probably want to wrap it up. Is there anything you want to add or that you want to share with our audience or anything you, we might have missed, questions you would like us to ask you that we missed? Or any songs you want to sing? Or All any songs? Let's do a little <laughs> the floor dance. Is yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you did. Uh, uh, how can people act was something that you had, um, we had talked about in the pre-interview for this. And uh, I'd like to encourage people to come out uh, and code with us and um, help build it with us, right? So this is not a prescriptive movement. We're not looking to hand software that's a solution to people. It's all boxed up and pretty, and uh, and 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 now we're done, right? So uh, we're we've got a large community on Slack. I think we're at like 1,700, and uh, you know we're asking people to help build it with us, pilot it with us. Like I went through those pilots we're doing in Sri Lanka. We're doing some at the University of California, Santa Cruz. We've Birmingham. So yeah, we're asking people to come and code with us to help test it with us. Um, you if know, they to wanted help. to join the Slack community, how would they do that? I tell you what, go to our website, democracy.earth. So I have to type and then uh, it'll say like code with us and just click on that. Great. Uh, and also, um, we are, uh, we spent all this time talking about um, initial coin offerings and an initial country offering and uh Democracy Earth is holding a token sale, and it's slated for 2Q of 2018, so somewhere between April and July timeframe. And we are in our pre-sale right now. Uh, it started on February 1st, uh, but that is open only to accredited investors, excluding people from New York and China. So uh, people who have been following us and listening to this will immediately be offended and say, why didn't I know that? Uh, and, and that's why. Can we why. vote on that? <laughs> <laughs> I, can't I, vote. Actually, I actually haven't had this question. But yeah, we're about 60% subscribed. Um, and then when we reach our pre-sale cap of 50 million tokens, then we'll uh, be preparing for our ICO. Santi and Pia and Herb Stevens will be doing a road show. So uh, Santi will be at Blockstack Berlin, which is kind of like I'm calling the cypherpunk fair. Because uh, it's like they've got everybody. It's a who's who in cryptography on the stage. So it's Santi, it's Elizabeth Stark uh, from Lightning Networks. It's uh, when is that? Berlin, uh, March 2nd. Very cool. So, yeah, you guys want to tune into that. So, um, definitely want to check that out. And please, if you want to learn about our ICO and see about our token economics, uh, you can also access our white paper. Um, just go to ico.democracy.earth and you can have a look at that. Check us out on uh, Twitter because we're you know making a really strong effort to keep track of the ICOs, help people make sense of what's happening right now during this period of like uh, regulatory uncertainty and kind of seismic shift in power, which is you know basically what we're seeing. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. And just want to thank you again, Sandra. It was really a pleasure having you. I'm really excited. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Yeah, thank you All right, so thanks much. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, uh, that's it, guys. That's the Positive Feedback Loop special episode with Democracy Earth. Thank you for staying tuned in, listening, and as always, stay crazy. crazy.